Father, we declare in your house today, amongst your children, in your city, your generation, that you are champion. You are the champion of every season, the champion of every circumstance, the champion of every opportunity that you give us. Lord, you are the champion. And Lord, you told us that you are the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, today and every day, teach us to follow your way. Teach us to live in your ways. Lord, more than just ticking boxes, more than following rules, more than any of that. Teach us to live in a way that imitates you, that honors you. Lord, we are your apprentices. We build and shape and form our lives upon your word, your teachings your presence. Lord, I ask you one more time, help us to imitate you. Holy Spirit, form and shape us into the image of Christ. Lord, if there's one thing we walk away with today, let it be the confidence, the assurance, the boldness, that you are with us and that you are working in us. Lord, we commit these next few moments into your hands. Let your will be done. Let your purposes be established in our lives, our families, our ministries. And we yield and surrender our hearts and our minds to your way not the way of this world, not the way of, of, of peer pressure or expectations, but the way of your word, the way of your presence, the way of your kingdom. We yield and surrender ourselves to that. And we pray that where we are weak, Lord, that you would be strong. Grace us today with a willing and obedient heart to serve you and to honor you. We thank you today. And in everything, we are careful to give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. You can put your hands together for the Lord today. Amen. You can take your seats. Praise the Lord. You already have. Amen. That's all good. Worship team, again, thank you so much for the sacrifice. You know, when we come into this atmosphere, it's not a Sunday that creates that atmosphere. It's their prayer life. It's their Thursday night practices. It's their fasting. It's their all of that. And so I'm grateful that I get to walk into a church where the presence of God is, and I don't say this lightly, in so many ways and so many times, so tangible. Like you can just sense God's here. And so I just want to take this opportunity to thank God for my salvation. Um, I think it was 25 years ago that God saved me, God called me, God chose me. I think the Apostle Paul says it like this in Scripture. At just the right time, the Father deemed it right to reveal his son in the Apostle Paul's heart. And I thank God that he revealed his son in my life. Um, and I, I, I love him with everything that I can. I say all my heart, but tomorrow will be a little bit more I need to push through, but I thank God for him. Um, if you don't know me, by the way, also my name is James. I'm one of the ministers here. I've um, been serving here in Richard H. Manchester for 10, 10 years. I spent 15 years in London also. Um, and just to bring a word of greeting, I'm not sure if this has been done, but Pastor Paul is not here. Um, he is in America with his daughter, Lily. Um, and she is going on to another six-month mission trip, amen. How many people are blessed by seeing a transformation in Lily's life? And so she's now going back for another six months 
Pastor Paul's not going for six months. Pastor Paul is definitely not going for six months. He'll be back very soon. Um, but I have a privilege of being able to share the word today. Um, and I'm going to speak about the unseen grace. And I want you to turn your Bibles or scroll on your phone, open your apps, whatever it may be, to Psalms 127. Psalms 127. I want to read a couple of verses. And the word that um, I really believe that God has put on my heart is something that I'm assured and confident that for each and every one of us, no matter how long we've been walking with the Lord, no matter how long we've been a Christian, whether even you're in here today and you're not a Christian, but you, you're intrigued, I believe that what we talk about today has meaning and purpose for each and every one of our lives. Psalms 127 verse 1 and 2 says this, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. I want to read also from Psalms 128 verse 1. It says this, Blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in obedience to him. You will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperity will be yours. Amen. You know, one of the keys to reading and studying scripture faithfully is taking a step back and looking at its context. Who wrote it? Why was it written? In what style was it written? You know, when you read scripture, when you read the Bible, it's not just one book in many ways, although it's one story. There's 66 books in there. You've got poetry. You've got letters. You've got biographies. You've got apocalyptic literature, these big words. You've got so many different styles of writing. And one of the things to read scripture faithfully is to take a step back and say, what am I reading? Who wrote it? Why did they write it? Who did they write it to? Psalms 127 that core scripture for today is actually one of 15 psalms from Psalms 120 to 134 that is called the Psalms or the Songs of Ascents. It means the Psalms or Songs that Ascend. And those Psalms 120 to 134 are grouped together for a reason and for a purpose. And most scholars will come to the conclusion but these 15 psalms, these 15 songs, were sung and recited by Jewish men when they made the pilgrimage from their home to the Jewish temple in, in Jerusalem three times a year. Three times a year, the Jewish men would pack up their belongings, they would prepare their homes, they would do what they do, and they would journey to the temple in Jerusalem to celebrate, to remember, and to offer to God. These 15 psalms, they believe, were recited and spoken and sung by them as they journeyed to the temple. We find this in Deuteronomy 16, the instruction from God. Deuteronomy 16, verse 16 to 17 says this, Three times a year, all your men must appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose, which is the temple in Jerusalem, at the festival of unleavened bread, the festival of weeks, and the festival of tabernacles. No one should appear before the Lord empty handed. Each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord your God has blessed you. Has anyone been blessed by God in this place today? Right? We've got something to bring to Him. But when you read through the scriptures, you see this will become a permanent fixture in the Jewish life, in the Jewish people's life. But this is the interesting thing, is when you read through the Old Testament, Israel's story was far from straightforward. How many people you could say, you know what, my story has been far from straightforward, give me a wave. There's been some ups and downs, there's been some complications sometimes. Israel's story was far from straightforward. In 586 B.C., we find it in the Old Testament, the temple that they would journey to was burnt down and destroyed by the Babylonian Empire. That Babylon came into Jerusalem, destroyed their city, set fire to their temple, destroyed their walls and took the people of Israel and dispersed them across the empire. They were taken from their homes. 
their families, their jobs, their careers, what they were used to. They were taken from their homes and sent into exile. It was far from a straightforward journey for Israel. That was in 586 BC. Just 70 years later, many of, or some of the Jewish people came back into Jerusalem and rebuilt the temple. You read about that in Ezra, Nehemiah, and some of the prophetic books. The temple was rebuilt. But yet, through all of this, through the destruction of their city, through being sent into exile, through some of them returning to Israel, they continued to make this pilgrimage to the temple in Jerusalem, to remember, to celebrate, to lament, to bring offerings to God. And I think sometimes our situation can be quite similar. Our stories can be quite similar, but sometimes, as much as we have to be thankful for, sometimes we've also got many things that we worried about. How many people you could say today that you come into this place and there's some things you can praise God for and there's some things you're saying, God, where are you? God, when are you going to move in this situation? I believe that when they made that journey, sometimes across nations, across mountains, across landscapes, they would come to the temple and there was something in them that praised God and there was something in them that wrestled with God and struggled with God to say, God, this used to be our home. This used to be where my parents and my grandparents were raised and now we make this journey again and there's joy and sorrow in my heart at the same time. I'm grateful and thankful for what you've done, but there's still certain things I need you to do. How many of us can say, God, I thank you for what you've done, but God, there's some things I still need you to do. There's some areas I need you to touch. There's some people I need you to save. There's some areas I need you to get a hold of. God, I know you're good. You are champion, but yet there's still some things I struggle with. I believe that when they made that journey, historians, historians would say that if you were more than 15 days journey away from the temple, you didn't need to go. But that journey could take 15 days travel to get to the temple. And on that journey, you would be remembering things. You would be celebrating things. You would be lamenting and mourning things. I remember in 2016, I went to Jamaica with my family. Uh, my wife's family are from Kingston, Jamaica, and we went to celebrate my mother-in-law's 60th birthday. And I remember when we were over there, there was about 13 of us, and Pops, as they call him, their dad, he took us to the home that he first lived in when he moved out of his house, the first ever place he lived in by himself. I think he was about 17 years old. And he took us down to Kingston, Jamaica, and he took us into his home and the yard that he grew up in and where he worked and the plants that he used to pick and the aloe vera plants that were growing. And he began to show us around this place. He lives in Bristol now, but he began to show us his home. He began to show us his culture. He began to show us his memories. And I'll never forget the look on his face that 50 years later, here he was surrounded by his children, and his grandchildren, they got to share this moment with him. The joy that was in his face, as you could see, you know, ever see scenes where you can literally see the memories come to their mind. And I almost feel like for the people that made this journey to the temple, there was something similar going on. There was so much to remember, so much to lay a hold of, but yet so much they were still hoping for. So much they were still waiting on God Four. These three festivals that they would celebrate were called Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot. The festival and celebration of Passover was the reminder to them that God had brought them out of Egypt. You read the story in Exodus when Israel was enslaved in Egypt under the armies of Egypt, under Pharaoh. And it says that God raised up Moses and he delivered Israel out from slavery, out from imprisonment, brought them through the Red Sea, overthrew their enemies, and brought them into freedom. They would celebrate this on their way to the temple, and as they reached the temple, they would celebrate that their God had brought them victory. 
that their God was champion, that he had broken slavery, he had broken addiction, he had broken depression, he had broken loneliness, he had broken violence, he had broken racism, he had broken these things. God is champion and he is champion over anything which opposes his creation. When they made that journey, though life might not have been what they wanted it to be. Life might not have given them the cards they felt they deserved, but yet in that moment they remembered our God is champion. He is Yahweh. He is the warrior God, the Lord of hosts. I want to let you know today that he is the warrior God, the Lord of hosts. Anything which opposes God's purpose and direction for your life, my friend, he is champion. He overthrows and overcomes anything that opposes you. They remembered and celebrated that their God was a warrior. Life wasn't exactly what they wanted it to be. They had some things that they had to wrestle through and struggle through, but it didn't change the faithfulness of God. The second festival they celebrated was called the Festival of Shavuot, and it was a festival to remember that as God had brought them out of Egypt, God had broken everything that had oppressed them, God had overthrown Pharaoh, the armies of Egypt, the gods of Egypt. God had brought victory and deliverance in their midst. This celebration was a celebration that not only did God bring them out of something, but God brought them to himself. At Mount Sinai, Exodus 19 and 20, God gives Israel the Ten Commandments, and it was symbolic that he was entering into a covenant with his people. I thank God that not only did God break things off my life, but he has shaped my life. It's not enough, Victory Outreach Manchester, for God just to set you free from something. You've got to allow God to bring you into something. It's not enough to simply say, and this was the words, what did God command Moses and Aaron to say? He said, let my people go that they may chill, Let my people go that they may create their own destiny. Let my people go that they may do what they want. No, let my people go that they may worship me. Let my people go that they may be my children. God didn't set them free so they could just chill. God didn't set them free so they could just do their own thing. God set them free so that he could call them to himself and send them as a light to the nations. This story doesn't end with what you used to be. I thank God that we're in a church and we serve a God where we've seen addiction broken. I thank God that we've seen marriages restored. We've seen young men and young women serve the Lord. We've seen God do so much in our midst. We've seen professionals that have come and said, God, you are the only one who satisfies my soul. People from every background, every nation, every culture, every circumstance that comes in the same boat and says, Lord, you are all I want. You're all I desire. I thank God that I stand in a church where nothing is impossible for God. We have faith to believe. But your story doesn't finish when your addiction is broken. Your story doesn't finish when your depression is gone. Your story doesn't finish in in any of these moments. Your story is never finished because he brings you to himself and there's always more of him to know. That's why some people always ask, what's my calling? Your calling is to know Christ. Your mission might be to go and bear light somewhere, but your calling is him which is why you never truly fulfill your calling. You can't say, I'm done, because there's more of him to know. I thank God that when I came into Victory Outreach at 16 years old, and I came with my head down, depressed, angry, bitter, frustrated, lonely, and God began to take those things bit 
by bit, season by season, encounter by encounter, moment by moment, step by step. He began to shed me of the labels that have been put on my life by my family, by my friends. He began to shed me of the images and mentalities that I had shaped in my mind. But that wasn't the end of the story. Just because he set me free didn't mean he was done with me. He began to raise me up. He began to put his hand on my life. And the story continued. I got my education. The story continued. I needed God to do more. When I went and I got married, I needed God to bring me to himself because I didn't know how to be a husband. So God had to bring me close. And then I had children. And I said, God, again, the story continues to shape me and form me as a father because I can't do it on my own. And then God said, okay, but James, I'm not done with you. Now you're going to pack your bags and you're going to move from London to Manchester with your family. I'm not done with you. And he begins to shape me and form me again. And then he says, James, you think I'm done? I'm not done. And then he takes me into education. And the 16-year-old boy who didn't have one qualification got his degree and then his master's degree and now studying his PhD because God wasn't done with me. The story doesn't end with what he brought you out of. The story continues in every season and circumstance of your life. You know, the temple was really interesting. Really, really interesting. Let me say this. If you ever try and read through Exodus, the last half of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers... And you've got all these instructions, chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter. Of they built the seats like this, and they chose these curtains and these ring rods, and they built it in this shape. And it can be painstaking. But yet there's a reason why so much time is dedicated to the building of this temple. And it's because of this. When the Jewish people went to the temple, and you entered into the temple... The way it was built, the way it was shaped, the light, the words, the images, the pictures, the stories, the direction you entered the temple from, it was all designed to help them know that they were returning to the Garden of Eden. They were coming back to intimacy with God. The Garden of Eden was a place where there was unbroken, uninterrupted communion with God. And when you stepped into that temple, when you journeyed to that temple, it was as if you were stepping back into the Garden of Eden. But God was calling you back to himself. The temple was like their eternal home. Hebrews says we, don't, we look towards the eternal city. We're like sojourners in this world. We are journeying through and God was bringing them back to himself. You know, there's a scripture throughout the Bible that comes up again and again and again. If you read the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, you will come across this saying, this statement. If you read the Psalms, you will come across this statement. If you read the prophets, you will come across this statement. If you read the epistles, you will come across the Apostle Paul saying this statement. And if you read Revelation... Revelation begins to close the story with this statement. I want to read it right here. Revelation 21, 1 to 4, and I'm going to let you know which part I'm speaking about here. But this comes up over and over and over again. And not only is it about how many times it comes up, but it comes up at every single stage of reading the Bible. In Revelation 21, 1 to 4, it says this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, and this is the part, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. In this statement, they will be his people And God himself will be with them and be their God. This comes up over and over again. That God says, I will be your God and you will be my people. The most important thing to God is not what he can give you. 
It's not the land he gives you. It's not the job he gives you. It's not the promotion he gives you. It's that he gives you himself. He gives you his presence. He gives you his son. I will be their God and they will be my people. When you sit with this scripture for a moment, it's humbling. It's reassuring. It's encouraging that in every season of life, he is your God and you are, you are his children. You are his possession. But yet, like I mentioned, the journey for them to get to the temple was not easy. They traveled countries, nations, weeks, months, whatever it may have took. They would have had to deal with a lot of emotions and feelings and memories. And that's why here in Revelation 21, God goes on to say, this end picture, that I will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. We read what right there in Psalms 127. He says, you toil, you worry, you fight for more. But he says, I give rest to my beloved. I love what David says when he's kidnapped by the Philistines and he's been imprisoned. He says in Psalms 56, as he's writing and singing to the Lord, he says this, Psalms 56 verse 8, you number my wanderings, you put my tears into your bottle, are they not in your book? I love that imagery. It's as if David is saying, God, you've got a bottle in heaven. And every tear that I shed, you remember it. Every tear that comes down my face, you know why. You know my heart. You know what you're doing in my life. And it's, he's saying, God, I know you never forget a moment of my suffering. You never forget a moment of what I've been through. And the thing that brings us so much joy as well is not only does God not forget, not only does God never, ever, ever miss one tear, one struggle, one battle, one moment, but there is a day that is coming where this bottle is going to be empty because there's going to be no more tears. There's going to be no more sorrow. There's going to be no more shame. There's going to be no more suffering. You're going to have a day. Maybe not in this life, but in soon to be, that this bottle is going to be empty because you're not going to shed any more tears. You're not going to go through any more of those struggles because he's going to have brought you to himself. Be careful of any theology that tries to tell you that you don't need to go through suffering in this life. Be careful of any theology that tells you that you're not going to shed any tears. If you've got enough faith, you won't suffer. If you've got enough faith, you won't get sick. If you've not got enough faith, you won't have financial struggles. Don't pay attention to those theologies because God shapes and forms us in the valley as much as he does on the mountaintop. The third festival that they celebrated was the festival of Sukkot. And this was not only did they celebrate that God had brought them out of Egypt, delivered them. Not only did they celebrate that God had brought them to himself, but they also celebrated the fact that God had kept them in the wilderness. God protected them. How many of us thank God that he's patient? I'll tell you what, I praise God for his goodness. I praise God for his power. I praise God for his glory. You better believe I praise him for his patience. Right? He says that he's been long-suffering to many of us, that he is a gracious and compassionate God. And when he saves you, and he delivers you, and he sets you free, and he brings you to himself, my friend, he keeps you. His grace is extended to you. But this intimacy with God is what stands at the center of our journey. Dallas Willard, an author, teacher, writer, was asked the question, how do I become the me that I want to be? How do I become the me that I want to be? And his response for me was pretty amazing. It's had an impact on, and I've gone through the scriptures, how it shaped and formed my life over recent months. And Dallas Willard goes on to say that there is a certain, what he would describe as the greatest enemy of our spiritual life. The greatest enemy of transformation or true discipleship. And I thought to myself, if I was asked that question, what is the greatest enemy of true discipleship? The greatest enemy of true intimacy with God? 
many things would probably come to my mind. I don't know what would come to your mind. But in my mind, I began to think about things like emotionalism, pride, liberalism, materialism, offense. So many things that could come against truly having transformation and intimacy with God. You know what he said is the greatest enemy of transformation, the greatest enemy of true discipleship and of true spiritual life? Hurry. Hurry. Being over busy. Too many things to worry about. Too many things to stress about. Too many things to do. He said the greatest enemy of true transformation, true intimacy, true spiritual life is always being in a hurry. Always being rushed. One person said it like this. I cannot live in the kingdom of God with a hurried soul. And immediately I think about the Mary and Martha situation. But Jesus has come to their house. Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus. And Martha is running around and she's probably cleaning and cooking and getting this and getting that and all of these different things. And she says to Jesus, Jesus, please tell Mary to help me. And what I always used to think about this passage is that it was about just simply being busy. And I realized it's not simply about being busy, it's about being worried. She was worried about many things. And because she was worried, she became busy. And the more she worried, the busier she got. And then the more she worried, the busier she got. Found more things to do, more things to do. And Jesus said, Martha, you worry about many things. But Mary has chosen the one thing that can never be taken away from her. You see, it's not that being busy is bad. But it's about the type of busyness and being over busy. This is why I think, in my opinion, Psalms 128 follows Psalms 127. Because Psalms 127 says, unless the Lord builds a house, the builders labor in vain. It's easy then to say, well, then I'll stop laboring. I'll stop working. I'll stop serving. I'll stop doing these things because it's all vanity. And actually, following up, it says in Psalms 128, when you fear the Lord and you walk in obedience to him, your labor will bring about fruitfulness. You see, there's a busyness that brings about vanity and there's a busyness that brings about fruitfulness. And the difference is whether you have been intimate with God before you begin your busyness. You can be busy your whole time. You can be busy all the way through your life and never bear fruit once. But when your busyness and your labor is rooted in the call of God and is rooted in intimacy with him, then your busyness, your labor will bring fruitfulness. But I've got to say this, and I've been guilty of this many times, there are a lot of Christians that are busy but not bearing any fruit because their busyness has not been released to them by God. You want, you want one of the greatest examples of what it means to be rushed and hurried? Go to London, right? I lived in London for 19 years. One particular example always sticks to my mind. I know if you're from London or you visited there, you'll know what I'm talking about. Every day I used to go to Stratford Tube Station, right? And you get on the train at Stratford, Stratford Tube Station, right? Um, some people are smiling at me because I think they know what I'm going to talk about, right? You get on the train, you'll see it. You've got the platforms and then you'll see this one train pulls in. It's the first stop. And hundreds and hundreds of people begin to cram onto the train, right? And you get your usual London tube stop. People are scrambling and fighting for seats, pushing people down. Someone gets on with a bike and really annoys you. Someone else is swinging their big backpack around. People are shouting at each other, move down, mate, the space there. And you get all this stuff in strap. You get all this stuff on the train, right? And you know what the crazy thing is? That's not the crazy thing, that people are rushed and hurried and pushing each other and forcing their way on. And someone always gets their heads hit by the doors as they close and... All of this stuff, but you know what the crazy thing is? Is that the same train going to the same destination is on the other side of the platform and is leaving in one minute. And yet no one sees that. They rush to this train. And here's me. I'm sitting on the other train. My feet up. Feels like I'm in first class because no one else there. Everyone else is there. And I'm sitting. I'm like, why are you doing that? You're so rushed. You're so hurried. And I don't know when in my life, if I can be vulnerable and honest, I don't know when in my life I began to live like that too, as a Christian. I began to rush from meeting to meeting, ministry to ministry, responsibility to responsibility. 
I began to move, and I thought the more I do, the quicker I do it, the more fruitful I'll be, the more, and I began to live in this hurried state, and because I was in a worried state, I was in a hurried state, and because I was in a hurried state, I never gave the best of anything to my children, to my family, to my ministry, because I was always worried. And God began to slow me down. He didn't take me out of anything, he began to slow me down. In the midst of all of this. And I would just sit there and watch people fight and scramble for this place on the train. And I began to realize as Christians, we do the same thing so many times. We rush and hurry and stress our way from season to season. Worrying about our finances. Worrying about our children. Worrying about our health. And I'm not saying there's not things to be concerned about. Believe me, I know there is. But a worried soul doesn't live in the kingdom well. A hurried soul doesn't live in the kingdom well. And God will sometimes slow you down. John 15, abide in me. Abide in me. If I could say one thing today, it's this. It was said to me many years ago. Stop striving and start abiding. We strive for so many things. And listen, like I said, I'm not playing down what anyone's going through. But worrying doesn't bring about the power, the peace, the joy, the authority of God in your life. It just causes you to rush and hurry from season to season and moment to moment. John Mark Comer said this in his book. If you're looking for a book to read, I recommend this book. The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. The ruthless elimination of hurry speaks about landmark moments in history that have shaped and changed our relationship with time, particularly in a Western context. And he makes mention above all else of three moments in history that have shaped and changed our relationship with time. The first one was in 1370 when the first public clock tower was built in Cologne, Germany. He said, up until this moment where the first public clock was built and erected, he said, the rhythms and seasons of your life were led by the sun and the moon and not the clock and your alarm. Right? He said that you went to bed with the moon and you got up with the sun. Days were long and busy in the summer, short and slow in the winter, but there was a rhythm to your life. But all of a sudden, as soon as this clock went up, you didn't listen to your body anymore. You listened to your employer. You listened, I'm not telling you to quit your job or rebel. You listen to your employer. <laughs> yeah, I need to throw that in. You, you listen, you don't listen even to the leading of God. You listen to the deadlines and the targets and the responsibilities. And all of a sudden we begin to work harder but with less fruitfulness. The rhythms changed of life. Up until this point, we put ourselves under the control of the sun and the moon, which were under the control of God. And then all of a sudden, people began to put themselves under the control of the clock and time. In 1879, Thomas Edison created the light bulb. Do you know how many hours on average people slept before the light bulb? Check this out. This is going to make you cringe. Do you know how many hours people slept on average before the light bulb? 11 hours a night. 11 hours a night. Go back three months. I don't even think I've got 11 hours a week. All right, I was, I was so busy, man. I, was so, I don't even know if I got 11 hours a week, man. I was like, 11 hours a night. But guess what? God's kingdom was still built. Souls were still getting saved. The only time I like 11 hours a night sleep is when it's my son. So I used to him getting up at 6 a.m. every morning, and now he's reached that age where he's getting up at like 9, and I'm like, praise the Lord, you do those 11 hours, man. You know, you get dark curtains, switch the lights off. You sleep, man, you sleep. You see, but all of a sudden, it didn't matter when the sun went down. It didn't matter when the moon came up. It didn't matter. Because before, if you work seven hours, now with a light bulb, you can work eight. You can work nine. If you work 10, you can work 12. You can work harder. You can do more. You can push further. You can do all of these things. Because that's the way we bear fruit, right? By working harder. Filling more calendar slots, arranging more meetings, doing more, doing more, doing more, doing more. And before we realize it, we're doing more, but bearing no more fruit. Because intimacy's been missed. And then the third one, 
You may know by the year that I say in 2007 was the invention of the iPhone. This changed everything. And this is the thing, I'm an 80s kid, right? 1982, I'm an 80s kid. I remember, forget even phones, I remember I had four channels on my TV. Didn't have five, channel five wasn't even launched then. That dodgy channel, channel four, there was four channels. Right? I didn't have five, I had, you couldn't pause, you didn't have on demand, you couldn't rewind, you couldn't record, you had four channels. I'd come home from school and watch my favorite cartoons, Teenage Mutant Hero Turtle, Super Ted, Inspector Gadget, all of these programs I'd get up on Saturday morning and we had four channels. I remember the phone, have they got a picture of that phone up here? Can you put the other phone? Can you put a picture of it? How many people remember? I had that phone in my house. If you remember that phone, it was the one where you had to dial the number and it went all the way around and then you'd have to wait for it to come. It took you like an hour and a half to call anyone. Right? If you wanted to call someone, you started way before. And heaven forbid if you got burgled, because by the time you call 999, you're probably unconscious on the floor anyway. It would take you like an hour to call the police. Right? That, that's what I remember. You know how you know you're really an 80s kid for me is that I could go to the shop with 30p and come out with a Freddo chocolate, a packet of Space Raiders, and a drink for 30p. That, that's how I lived. That's the kind of life I lived. The life of luxury. Right? I remember. I remember even as a kid finding like 80p and thinking, oh my gosh, I could buy like eight chomps, eight fudges, eight... I could, I could do so much with this money. But time has changed. Time has changed. Do you know on average, the amount of times an average iPhone user touches their phone a day? 2,617 times a day. You see, a company can get your money if they get your attention. And that's all they want from you is your attention. But I wonder if we've failed to give God our attention in the midst of all of this busyness. Proverbs 19 verse 2 says this, Desire without knowledge is not good. How much more will hasty feet miss the way? Proverbs 21.5, The plans of a diligent lead to profit, as surely as haste leads to poverty. I want to finish with this in Psalms 127, 1 and 2, as we begin to wind down. I believe this statement about the Lord builds a house, and in, or you, you do it in vain if it is not the Lord building the house. I believe it speaks to two things. The first thing I believe it speaks to is those people that are building, resourcing, and committing their time to something that God never told you to. Sometimes in life, we get so distracted and so consumed by giving and building in areas that God has not called us to. Now, let me be clear about this. I'm not saying that you have to pray about helping pack away chairs or pray about helping your children or pray about these things. But what I am saying is that many times God has called us into missions and ministries and areas of life and work and all these different things and we resource and give so much of ourselves to something that God has not called us to. You know what I love about this is that it says that the labor without God leads to vanity. It doesn't mean it won't succeed. It just means it won't satisfy. And there's a difference. You can build something in this life that will succeed, but it doesn't mean it will satisfy. I've always believed this, as I've heard it said, the greatest danger for Christians is not failure. It's being successful at the wrong things. And I also believe this, that this scripture also speaks to those, and maybe this is a majority, that are doing the will of God, that are in the place God wants them to be. But you're not doing it in the grace of God anymore. You're hurried, you're worried. You're moving from moment to moment, day to day, situation to situation, and your heart is not filled with the peace and joy and hope of God. It's filled with worry and hurry. And you're still doing the work of God, but maybe in the midst of it all, you've begun to miss the God of the work. 
And it's easy to reach a place in life of disappointment, frustration, difficulty. But what we can't ever do in the midst of those things is begin to do things in our own strength. Begin to move in our own understanding and our, our own wisdom. And it was a few months ago that God really began to get my attention and said, James, you're doing all the right things, but you're not bearing fruit in the way you're meant to because there's no intimacy anymore. You're just moving from moment to moment, situation to situation. My prayers were filled with prayers of worry. Isn't it crazy? I don't know if you've ever done this, but you can pray and feel more worried at the end of your prayer than we were at the beginning because you just spent the whole time talking about what you were worried about. There was no faith in it. There was no expectation in it. There was no hope in it. There was no humility in it. And I say this in the nicest way. I believe that today is a call to repentance. It's to bring ourselves before God again and say, whether you've begun to put your hands to things that God hasn't told you to, or maybe you are doing the will and the work of God, but you have a hurried or worried soul. I believe God wants to call us to himself again this morning. Bring us back to him. There can be points in our life. This happened to the children of Israel where their answer to prayer became a burden to them. Where they said, God, bring us out from Egypt. Bring us out from slavery. And they came out of slavery into freedom. And then that freedom became a burden to them because they were worried, scared, afraid. And maybe even to some of you today, maybe you're in a situation that you prayed for, that God answered. You've lost sight of him in it. I want you to stand to your feet today all across this place. We're going we're gonna to do something very, very simple. We're going to come to him. I don't know if you have a hurried soul today. I don't know if you have a worried soul. I don't know if you've been over busy. I don't know if you need to come back to him in the midst of all the pressures and responsibilities and opportunities and all of these things and simply just say, Lord, I need you to build my house. Can we lift our hands in this place and just want you to begin to speak to him. Begin to talk to him. If God has been getting your attention this morning, if God has been even slowing you down right here in this service, maybe God has been reminding you of things, whatever it may be, I want you to begin to talk to him today. As the worship team begins to lead us, we're going to take a few moments and then we're gonna, I'm going to invite you to respond. But I want your response to begin now and begin to speak to him and begin to talk to him.